Hey everybody, welcome back to Live with Doug. We are once again recorded. I'm not live with you. We're getting close, getting close to the end. We're also getting close to the end of our little series here, The Kingdom and the Last Days, and we're almost at Matthew 24, but I want to spend the time to go through three chapters in Daniel, which means I'm going to have to read them and comment as we go. And I don't know how I'm going to keep this to a a normal time period of about 25 minutes, but we're going to give it a shot. It's so important to understand, at least to be familiar with the content of these chapters before you try to interpret the kingdom and the last days, especially as Jesus described them in Matthew 24. There's a lot of fascinating stuff in these three chapters, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to just share my thoughts as we go, and uh, I can't spend as much time as I'd like to, but it is fascinating. I hope you are as intrigued as, as I am. All right, Daniel 10. In the third year of King Cyrus of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who is also called Belteshazzar. This message was true and concerned a great war. So Daniel's seeing war time here. He understood the message and gained insight by the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three whole weeks. So when he sees all these battles and the devastation, he's, he's brought to tears. This hit him hard. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine came to my lips. <laughs> by the way, I love that. <laughs> When he's in a period of mourning, he eats no meat and drinks no wine. What does that tell you? Well, I'll tell you what it tells me. (laughs) When I'm not in a period of mourning, I'm going to eat meat and drink wine. (laughs) None of this vegetarian. Anyway, nor did I anoint myself with oil until the end of those three weeks. So this, this really hit Daniel hard. On the 24th day of the first month, I was beside the great river, the Tigris. I looked up and saw a man clothed in linen. Around his waist was a belt made of gold from Uphaz. His body resembled yellow jasper. His face had an appearance like lightning. His eyes were like blazing torches. His arms and feet had the gleam of polished bronze. His voice thundered forth like the sound of a large crowd. Imagine that, this strange glorious being and his voice like you know think about being in a uh, a football stadium 80,000 people cheering one voice with that kind of power and force the this is another intimidating scene only i daniel saw the vision the men who were with me did not see it on the contrary they were overcome with fright and ran away to hide which of course raises the question, did they hear the voice but ran off? What, you know, what, what did they actually perceive? I don't know. I alone was left to see this great vision. My strength drained from me and my vigor disappeared. I was without energy. I listened to his voice. And as I did so, I fell into a trance-like sleep with my face to the ground. Then a hand touched me and set me on my hands and knees. He said to me, Daniel, you are of great value. Gotta love that. Understand the words that I'm about to speak to you. So stand up, for I have now been sent to you. Again, as I brought up the other day, this angelic being was sent, which means he had to travel. Hold that thought. When he said this to me, I stood up shaking. Then he said to me, don't be afraid, Daniel, for from the very first day you applied your mind to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. I have come in response to your words. Imagine that you, imagine this being you, you want to understand, you ask the Lord for knowledge, for insight, to understand what's going on. And God's answer is he sends this creature, this heavenly being, this angelic, glorious being. But being sent means you start in a a location and you end up in a location. 
So he says, I was sent. However, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was opposing me for 21 days. Do you see that? He is sent to deliver the information to Daniel, but he has to fight with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. There's another angelic being who commands an army. And in order for this one to get from God to Daniel, he has to fight through this king of Persia. These are not human beings we're talking about here. There's a spiritual, a real spiritual battle. You know, we, we sometimes use the word spiritual battle to talk about things that are just with our, when our own, uh, within our own head. These are true spiritual beings. And by spiritual, I mean non-human who are fighting. And he has to fight for 21 days. But Michael, one of the leading princes, came to help me because I was left there with the kings of Persia. <laughs> Do you see this? This angel is coming to speak to Daniel, but he needs help from Michael to come defeat the king of Persia. Now I have come to help you understand what will happen to your people in future days. Can you guess what those words are in the Greek translation, in the Septuagint? In the last days. I've come to help you understand what will happen to your people, the Jews, in the last days. The last days are about the Jews of the first century. The last days of all the previous kingdoms before the setting up of the kingdom of Christ. The last days of the old covenant era. That's what I think he's talking about. For the vision pertains to days to come. For Daniel. While he was saying this to me, I was flat on the ground and unable to speak. Then one who appeared to be a human being was touching my lips. I opened my mouth and started to speak, saying to the one who was standing before me, Sir, due to the vision, anxiety has gripped me and I have no strength. How, sir, am I able to speak with you? My strength is gone and I'm breathless. So again, Daniel's just wiped out from this. Then the one who appeared to be a human being touched me again and strengthened me. He said to me, Do not be afraid. You are highly valued. Why is Daniel even learning the answer to his questions when these things pertain to the end centuries in the future? Because God values him highly. Peace to you. Be strong. Be really strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened. I said, Sir, you may speak now, for you have given me strength. He said, Do you know why I've come to you? Now I'm about to return to engage in battle with the prince of Persia. When I go, the prince of Greece is coming. Isn't that interesting? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. The battles on earth here are also being fought in the non-human realm. And there are princes and armies, warriors in that realm. I'll tell you, the more I have pondered this recently, the more fervent and I would say different my prayers have become. Maybe we'll talk about that sometime. However, I will first tell you what is written in a dependable book. Literally in the Hebrew, it's the book of truth. Apparently, there's a book written down that this angel has access to, and he says, I'm going to tell you what's in it. There is no one who strengthens me against these princes except Michael, your prince. So there's a prince of Persia, or king over the kingdom of Persia, and Michael is the prince over Daniel's people, the Israelites. The angel goes on. In the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood to strengthen him and to provide protection for him.
weird. <laughs> this angel is protecting Darius, the Persian king. Now I will tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise for Persia. Then a fourth king will be unusually rich, more so than all who preceded him. When he has amassed power through his riches, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a powerful king will arise, exercising great authority and doing what he pleases. That's probably Alexander the Great. So do you see what's going on? You've got these spirit kings that are doing battle against other angelic beings. And in the book, it is written that they're going to be the kings of Persia, but then the, this great powerful king, Alexander the Great, is going to arise. This is all written in the book beforehand. Shortly after his rise to power, his kingdom will be broken up and distributed toward the four winds of the sky. We saw that in an earlier vision. But not to his posterity or with the authority he exercised, for his kingdom will be uprooted and distributed to others besides these. Alexander did not hand off his kingdom to his children kind of thing. Then the king of the south and one of the subordinates will grow strong. His subordinate will resist him and he will rule a kingdom greater than he. This is probably Ptolemy. This is the kingdom of the south would be Egyptian kings, that kind of thing. After some years have passed, they will form an alliance or covenant. Then the daughter of the king of the south will come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she will not retain her power, nor will she continue nor will he continue in his strength. She, together with the one who brought her, her child and her benefactor, will all be delivered over at that time. So you, we're going to see this, this revelation of these upcoming battles between king of the north, king of the south, all of these Egyptian Ptolemies, uh, others, back and forth, back and forth. And I don't have time to try to piece through all of this with you, but it is fascinating to think about. There will arise in his place one from her family line who will come against their army and will enter the stronghold of the king of the north and will move against them successfully. He will also take their gods into captivity to Egypt, along with their cast images and prized utensils of silver and gold. Then he will withdraw for some years from the king of the north. Then the king of the north will advance against the empire of the king of the south, but will withdraw to his own land. His sons will wage war, mustering a large army that will advance like an overflowing river and carrying the battle all the way to the enemy's fortress. Then the king of the south will be enraged and he will march out to fight against the king of the north who will also muster a large army, but that army will be delivered into his hand. When the army is taken away, the king of the south will become arrogant. He will be responsible for the death of thousands and thousands of people, but he will not continue to prevail. For the king of the north will again muster an army one larger than another. At the end of some years, he will advance with a huge army and enormous supplies. Now, what I think is going on, and again, I just have to summarize this, and I don't, I haven't figured every nuance out. I don't know if I can. But there is sort of this twofold setup, it seems to me, that you have some, some of the, the, um, the, the known kings, the, the, the people we now know, but it's quickly going back and forth between these kingdoms, and it's not intended to give us an exhaustive history. I mean, for Daniel, it doesn't matter anyway. He's going to be long dead, but we have enough to go back and trace, like Ptolemy, like Alexander the Great, like Cleopatra, and be able to see this was all written down beforehand, which is fascinating. And then you've got the interplay of the, you know, the kings in the uh, spiritual realm. In those times, many will oppose the king of the south. Those who are violent among your own people rise up in confirmation of the vision, but they will falter. So the Jews are going to stand up at some point, but they won't prevail. We know that after the fall of Jerusalem in 586, the Jews, except for a very small period of time under the Maccabees, they were not able to conquer their enemies. Then the king of the north will advance and will build siege mounds and capture a well-fortified city. The forces of the south will not prevail, not even his finest contingents. They will have no strength to prevail. The one advancing against him will do as he pleases and no one will be there to stand before him. He will prevail in the beautiful land, probably Israel, and its annihilation will be within his power. His intention will be to come with the strength of his entire kingdom. He will form alliances. He will give the king of the south a daughter in marriage in order to destroy the kingdom, but it will not turn out to his advantage. That's probably Cleopatra. 
Then he will turn his attention to the coastal regions and will capture many of them. But a commander will bring his shameful conduct to a halt. In addition, he will make him pay for his shameful conduct. He will then turn his attention to the fortresses of his own land, but he will stumble and fall and not be found again. There will arise after him one who will send out an exactor of tribute to enhance the splendor of the kingdom. But uh, after a few days, he will be destroyed, though not in anger or battle. That's interesting. Then there will arise in his place a despicable person to whom the royal honor has not been rightfully conferred. He will come on the scene in a time of prosperity and will seize the kingdom through deceit. This is Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a great wicked man. Armies will suddenly be swept away in defeat before him. Both they and a covenant leader will be destroyed. After entering into an alliance with him, he will behave treacherously. He will ascend to power with only a small force. In a time of prosperity for the most productive areas of the province, he will come and accomplish what neither his fathers nor his fathers nor their fathers accomplished. He will distribute loot spoils and property to his followers and devise plans against fortified cities, cities, but not for long. He will rouse his strength and enthusiasm against the king of the south with a large army. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to prevail because of the plans devised against him. Those who share the king's fine food will attempt to destroy him. So he's going to bless them and they're going to turn on him. And his army will be swept away. Many will be killed in battle. These two kings... Their minds filled with evil intentions will trade lies with one another at the same table, but it will not succeed for there still is, there is still an end at the appointed time. Then the king of the north will return to his own land with much property. His mind will be set against the holy covenant or the holy alliance they made. He will take action and then return to his own land. At an appointed time, he will invade the south, but the, the latter visit will not turn out the way the former one did. The ships of Katim will come out against him. In the Greek translation, this is the Romans. So now we have the Romans entering the picture, the Roman Empire, the Roman armies, leaving him disheartened. He will turn back and direct his indignation against the Holy Covenant. He will return and honor those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Again, I think that's the alliance is not some biblical covenant. His forces will rise up and profane the fortified sanctuary, stopping the daily sacrifice. In its place, they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. So there's going to be some battles here with this fortified sanctuary and set up this abominable thing that causes desolation. Now, we're not told what that is exactly. But it's a phrase that is found here to describe something that is abominable (laughs) and that causes something to be wiped out and desolate. Then with smooth words, he will defile those who have rejected the covenant, but the people who are loyal to their God will act valiantly. So this is probably, again, the Maccabean revolt. And I just don't have time to get into that, but look it up. It's fascinating. Maccabeans were a group of Jews who rebelled and fought, and they won their independence for a few minutes. (laughs) This is in the second century BC. These who are wise among the people will teach the masses. However, they will fall by the sword and the flame. They will be imprisoned and plundered for some time. Again, they revolt, but they don't succeed in long-lasting independence. When they stumble, they will be granted some help, but many will unite with them deceitfully. Even some of the wise will stumble, resulting in their refinement, purification, and cleansing until the time of the end. So after the Maccabean revolt, Israel falls again. They're not independent. They're not their own nation. But there will be some who come out of that refined and purified and cleansed until the time of the end, for it is still for the appointed time, the kairos. 
You see that. He is describing what's written in this book is all these battles, southern, northern kingdom, uh, the northern lands, the Egyptians, back and forth, back and forth. Got Antiochus Epiphanes, this evil ruler comes in and just treats the Jews uh, awfully. And he's the one that, again, sacrifices the pig in the, in the temple and all that. And the Jews revolt. The Maccabeans win independence for a short time. Then they're conquered again. But there will be some of the people of, of God who are cleansed and purified, who hold fast until the end. The end of what? The end of the age. The end that he's been talking about and seeing in these previous prophecies. Then verse 36. Here's where, if you could read the Greek translation, it doesn't say, well, it kind of, then the king will do, or a king. It, it, the article is there, but it, it doesn't mean it's the king that he's just been talking about. Obviously, I think this is talking about a different king. I think this is talking about the time of the end, the appointed time. So I'm just going to tell you what I think, and if I don't persuade you, fine. But I think we've gotten the history leading to the end of the age, which is the first century. Then this king will, uh, will arise who will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every deity, and he will utter presumptuous things against the God of gods. Remember a man named Seeger Augustus? Do you know what August means? We have a month, August, named after. August is exalted one or increased one. Some of the Caesars, especially Augustus, believed themselves to be gods. Think about the early church. They weren't persecuted because they said Jesus is Lord. They were persecuted because they said Caesar is not. If you believe in lots of gods, fine, so long as you say Caesar is a god. The first century Christians could not do that. I think he's talking about the Caesars here and maybe even specifically Caesar Augustus. He will exalt and magnify himself above every deity. He will utter presumptuous things against the God of gods. He will, ex he will succeed until the time of wrath is completed. For what has been decreed must occur. So this arrogant king, there is wrath that's been appointed. It's been decreed. It is necessary to happen. He will not respect the gods of his fathers, not even the gods loved by women. He will not respect any god. He will elevate himself above them all. What he will honor is a god of fortresses, a god his fathers did not acknowledge. He will honor with gold, silver, valuable stones, and treasured commodities. He will attack mighty fortresses aided by a foreign deity. To those who recognize him, he will grant considerable honor. He will place them in authority over many people, and he will parcel out land for a price. At the time of the end, the king of the south will attack him. Then the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, horsemen, and a large armada of ships. He will invade lands, passing through them like an overflowing river. Then he will enter the beautiful land. Many will fall, but these will escape. Edom, Moab, and the Ammonite leadership. He will extend his power against other lands. The land of Egypt will not escape. He will have control over the hidden stores of gold and silver, as well as all the treasuries of Egypt. Libyans and Ethiopians will submit to him. But reports will trouble him from the east and the north, and he will set out in a tremendous rage and destroy and wipe out many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas toward the beautiful holy mountain, but he will come to his end with no one to help him. All right, so I'm not convinced this is just one king. Again, the whole Roman kingship, emperorship, could be described here, as well as the evil forces behind the Caesars. And then chapter 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince who watches over your people, Daniel's people, the Israelites, Michael, who is assigned 
over the Israelites. He will arise. There will be a time of distress unlike any other from the nation's beginning up to that time. But at that time, your own people, all those whose names are found written in the book, will escape. You probably want to go read some Revelation now, don't you? So there's all these mounts, all these battles, rather, all these kings. And then Michael, the prince of Israel, is going to rise up and there will be a time of distress for Michael's people, the Israelites. Unlike any other from the nation's beginning up to that time. But at that time, your own people, the Israelites, all whose names are found written in the book, they will escape. So some will escape, some will not. Who will escape? Those whose names are in the book. Then, (laughs) so if I'm right about the timing of this, this is looking toward the siege of Jerusalem in the late 60s, climaxing in 70 AD when the city is burned down, the temple is destroyed. Let's check this out. Many of those who sleep in the dusty ground will awake. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting abhorrence. If the timing is consistent here, this is talking about some kind of a resurrection at the time of 70 AD. Interesting. But the wise will shine like the brightness of the heavenly expanse. And those bringing many to righteousness will be like the stars forever and ever. What's that? Is that gospel proclaimers? Is it something going on in the heavens? Is it Those who are resurrected, very interesting. And then it just ends. But you, Daniel, close up these words, seal the book until the time of the end. Many will dash about and knowledge will increase. I, Daniel, watched as two others stood there, one on each side of the river. One said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, when will the end of these wondrous events occur? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was over the waters of the river as he raised both his right and left hands to the sky and made an oath by the one who lives forever. It is for a time, times, and half a time. Then with the power of the one who shatters the holy people has been exhausted, all these things will be finished. Let me read that again. Then when the power of the one who shatters the holy people has been exhausted, all these things will be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. So I said, sir, what will happen after these things? He said, go, Daniel, for these matters are closed and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made clean and refined, but the wicked will go on being wicked. None of the wicked will understand, though the wise will understand. From the time that the daily sacrifice is removed and the abomination that causes desolation is set in place, there are 1290 days. Blessed is the one who waits and attains to the 1,335 days. But you should go your way until the end. You will rest. And then at the end of days, you will arise to receive what you have been allotted. There is so much there. it would be worth your time to really go slowly through that and compare it to other phrases in the New Testament and the book of Revelation. But I think the timing fits with everything else that Daniel saw. I think it's all pointing toward the end of the pre-kingdom of God age and the end of the old covenant age, the end of the Jewish age, and the beginning of the kingdom age, which started with the destruction of Jerusalem, the judgment upon the Roman kingdom, 
and the establishment of the Christian kingdom. All right, tomorrow, Matthew 24. God bless.